Hello and welcome to chapter 5 on water resources. In this chapter we'll look at water on earth, the soil water budget concept, surface and groundwater resources, overuse of groundwater, specifically the high plains aquifer, and our water supply. We'll also talk about water scarcity and how lack of water is affecting different regions of the world differently. Here's the boring list of things. Here's the list of good topics, good important questions. So where does water exist on Earth? Here's a spoiler. 97% of it is in the ocean. What is the nature of groundwater? Well, it's in the ground. It's fragile. It's easily polluted. It's impossible to clean. And it's a limited resource. What's the future of water resources? More people, less water. So let's talk about water on Earth. We got most of the water on Earth. A lot of the water on Earth came from outgassing, the discharge of gases by Earth. So this is water that was present when Earth formed out of that cloud of gas and dust and rocks. Massive quantities are released. It happened during Earth's beginning. It still happens today. We also got a lot of water for comets. If you check the water resources playlist that I've created on YouTube, I've got a couple videos in there that are relevant just for this chapter. Some of them on where we got our water. Other ones talk about uh, groundwater mining, which we'll talk about later. Uh, groundwater use in California specifically. Groundwater use in the High Plains Aquifer. So there's some really good videos that I think do a great job, much, much, much better job of explaining because they're animated than I can. There's one of them. You can go look at that. This is a picture of a location called Geyser. It's in Iceland. It's where we get the word geyser from. So what you're seeing is clouds of, uh, it was water vapor, but it's condensed. So you're actually seeing clouds of water. And one of the major components in volcanic eruptions is water vapor that then condenses and becomes this white clouded material. Where do we get the water? Well, some of it has been present from the beginning. Some of it we got from comets, but it's not evenly distributed. The oceans contain about 97%. Fresh water is less than 3% of all of the water on Earth. Most of that is frozen. Most of the water that isn't frozen is below the surface as groundwater that you can only get at with a well. If you look at the Pacific Ocean, if you were orbiting Earth over the Pacific Ocean, Earth looks like it's mainly water. If you were looking at Earth from the point of view someplace over, looks like centered over Africa, you'd see Africa and Eurasia. Most of the planet looks like it's covered by land. So here's the breakdown of water on Earth. As I mentioned, 97% of all the water on Earth is salty. It's in the ocean which leaves us with 3% of all the water on Earth. In fact, it's less than 3%. It's 2.8 or 2.78%. Uh, for my class, 97% of all the water is in the ocean. 3% of the water that's left is fresh water. Of that 3% that's fresh, let's break that down. So we have 3% that's fresh. 70% of it just about is frozen in ice sheets and glaciers. And about 30% of the fresh water is in the ground. Uh, again, that's water that you can get at with a well. So you can see the amount of liquid fresh water at the surface makes up 0.3% of the 2.8% of all of the water on Earth. So an incredibly small amount of water on Earth is actually liquid water at the surface in a lake. You can see streams. Uh, rivers and streams, 2% of the 0.3%, so hardly any water at the surface on Earth that is fresh. In fact, if you made a model of Earth and all of the water was a gallon, the amount of water that we could actually drink is about a tablespoon. Some water escapes into space. Some water is released from inside Earth to the atmosphere. So the amount of water that we've had on Earth has been relatively unchanged for about the last 2 billion years. We lose a little bit to space, but there is some 
water that still hasn't come out of the mantle that does come out of the mantle every year. And so we've had about the same amount. Sea levels go up and down based on how much of the water in the ocean, or rather, sea levels go up and down as more and less ice forms on the land. 20,000 years ago, sea levels were about 360 feet lower worldwide because about 30% of Earth was covered by ice. I think now about 10% of Earth is covered by ice. So a, a major difference in sea levels based on how much water is stored as ice. Let's talk about the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle. There's water, there's water vapor, there's ice. Those, all those circulate around the planet. They've been doing that for billions of years. Let's look at some of the big numbers. So there's my cursor. So we, over here we have evaporation. That's water that's leaving the surface of the ocean, going into the atmosphere as a gas. That condenses and then falls as rain. 78% of the rain falls over the ocean. 22% of the rain falls over the land. 14% of the evaporation takes place over the land. So let's go through all of these numbers one at a time. There's really only five numbers you need to know. 86% of the evaporation takes place over the ocean. 78% of the rain falls into the ocean. 14% of the evaporation happens over the land. 22% of the rain falls into the ocean. And then the amount of water that's called runoff, that would be streams, think of it as streams or rivers running off the land into the ocean. It's about 8% of all the water. So let's go through those again. We've got 86% of the evaporation over the ocean, 78% of the rain falling on the land, 14% of the evaporation off of the land, 22% of the rain falling on the land, and so if you're getting 22 and you're losing 14, that leaves 8, and that 8 represents runoff. So one of the ways you could study this would be to, to memorize one number and then 8 as the runoff. So 86% is the evaporation, which leaves 14 for evaporation off of the land, evaporation and transpiration happening off the land. So if 14% of the evaporation is happening over the land, 14% plus 8% is 22%, right? Which is the amount of, uh, do that again, 14% is the evaporation, 14 and 8 are the outflows off of the land, so the input's got to be 22 for everything to balance, because 14 and 8 are 22. The soil water budget concept is a very important idea. If you were a groundskeeper at a sports stadium or you were a farmer and you wanted to know exactly how much water you would need to add to balance out water lost to evaporation, you would use the soil water budget. In the soil water budget, here are a bunch of the key terms. Precipitation is the input. Precip is rainfall and snow and fog. So that's water coming into the system. Water leaves the system through evaporation off of the surface and transpiration, which is water lost or water used by plants that goes back into the atmosphere. You can make the scale at a variety of scales. You could look at it across all of North America. You could look at it at a city. You could look at, at one field in particular. So you can make it for a variety of spatial scales. You could also make it for different time scales. You could look at it on a, for one day. You could look at it as an average out, average over an entire year. So these budgets can be made for a variety of spatial scales and also temporal scales, and they're just used to help evalu evaluate water availability. So here's the way some of the water is actually moving in this model. We've got precip, which is rain falling from the sky. Some of that water is going to percolate down through the ground and become groundwater. Some of it is going to run off in streams. Some of it will evaporate off the surface. Some of it will be taken up by plants and then transpired away. And that's pretty much it. We've got water coming in through precip, water leaving through evaporation, water leaving through runoff, water leaving from transpiration, and then some water is transferred from the surface down to groundwater. This is the soil water budget. 
And let's go through these one at a time. There's the moisture supply, that would be precip, that's incoming, incoming water. Potet is the potential moisture demand, that's how much water, how much water is needed by the system. Actet is the actual amount of water that was used by the system, which is going to be limited by two factors. There's two sources of water. There's the moisture supply. This is precip. That's falling from the sky. And then there's also moisture savings. This is just water in the ground. If you have house plants and you water them, you know that you don't need to water them every day because some of the water stays in the soil. That's what this is. And there's a limit. There's, there's a limit to how much water, again, if you have house plants and you water them, you know that the soil can only soak up so much water before it starts to overflow and then ruin your furniture. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Usually four inches is used as the limit for the maximum amount of water that you can put into the ground before you start getting runoff. And that runoff is going to be this, moisture oversupply. So if there's more rain than the soil can hold, and there's more rain than the plants can use, then you're going to have runoff. And finally, moisture shortage, that's a deficit. So if, for example, you lived in a desert, the potet, the amount of water you need, would be greater than the supply, precip, and the storage, so you'd end up with a deficit. So some of these terms again, actual and potential evapotranspiration, probably the biggest words that we will use all semester. Precip is the water supply to the surface again. Water is lost from evaporation into the atmosphere and transpiration from plants. So transpiration, you can just think of that as plant sweat. The combination of evaporation and transpiration is called evapotranspiration. That's another key word. I put it in bold so you'd know it was important. Actual evapotranspiration, actet, is the amount of water that returns to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration. So that's the actual amount of water that got used by plants and the actual amount of water that evaporated. Potet is the amount of water that would get used if you had an unlimited supply of water. So I think of potet as representing the energy available to use water, either by plants or by evaporation. Here we have an oasis. Looks like they've got a positive moisture budget because they've got plants. If they didn't have a positive budget, they wouldn't have plants because they'd have a deficit. So soil moisture. Uh, water gets into the soil through precipitation. Recharge of soil moisture by precip and percolation into the ground. This is remote sensing. It's a device on a satellite that can actually calculate how much water there is in the ground. This is a really weird figure. It's expressed in cubic meters of water per cubic meters of soil. So if it was all water, it would be 1.0. 0. 0.5 means that half of the soil is actually water. So the darker the blue, the higher the percentage of water in the soil. Oh, and you can, you, see, you can even see the effect of, here we've got the Appalachians. I hadn't realized that before. Here on the coastal plains, that's probably where the storms are hitting first. But then over here, you've got orographic uplift, which enhances the amount of rainfall. So water deficit, when you have a deficit, you can have a drought. That's when you have uh, not as much precip as you need. When precip is less than poted over an extended time, you have a drought. Droughts can lead to forest fires in places like California. So precip, in the, in the formula, precip equals actet plus surplus plus or minus the change in soil moisture. We'll look at that in just a minute. If demand, if potet is greater than actet, then you have a deficit. This is a map showing annual precipitation for the United States, uh, well, most of North America anyway. So in, here in the southeast, there's the Gulf of Mexico and the really warm water in the Atlantic Ocean. So that's going to create maritime tropical air masses. So if you're on the east coast, or at least the southeast, you're going to have rain year-round and a lot of it. This extends up the eastern seaboard, up all, all the way up into Maine, with relatively high amounts of annual precip. Here in the southwest, it's dominated by the subtropical high, so it's drier there. 
as you go north on the west coast, you run into the polar front. And so precip values as you go north increase uh, as you go towards Canada. They decrease as you go towards Mexico. So the Pacific Northwest and the American Southeast have some of the highest values for rainfall. This map is showing Potet. Potet's really interesting. Potet is pretty much just a proxy for temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the potet. So the warmest places, Palm Springs, Arizona, Texas, Florida, the warmest places have the highest potet values. In fact, across the plains where it's pretty much just flat without a lot of elevation differences, it's just a function of latitude. The, the, you can see places where this doesn't hold true, like the patterns really disturbed across the Rockies. You can see the Sierras where it's higher and therefore lower amount of energy available to evaporate water. You can also see the same thing here in the Appalachians where they are higher, so they're colder. So you have less energy available to evaporate water, so they have lower potet values. In fact, the Appalachians have lower potet values because they're cooler. And I'll just back up. They also have higher precip values because they're higher. So here's the soil water budget. I've put my terms on top of it. I would recommend drawing this and I'll go through a couple examples using different cities that have different moisture uh, regimes. So precip, precip equals actet plus surplus plus or minus delta storage. Delta storage, delta means change. This is changes to the water in the soil. So for example, if you had a plant, a house plant, and you watered it at the beginning of the week, and you monitored it every day on that first day, there would be the change to the soil moisture would be positive because you've added water. For the rest of the week, though, every day the change is going to be negative as that plant uses up the water in the soil. So the storage, the what we're looking at isn't the actual amount of water, but how much the amount of water in the soil changed. And again, as a reminder, four inches is usually the uh, the value that's used in soil water budgets. In the plain states, there's incredibly deep soil, so you could put more water into the soil before it's full. Uh, other places like deserts typically have very, very thin soil, so there you might be able to only put a half an inch of water into the ground before it's saturated. But for most of our problems, we'll just use four inches because it's a realistic number. So let's look at these and do a soil, soil water budget. Let's take a look at Berkeley. Here we've got a blue line. This is precip. Typical California Mediterranean climate. Rain falls in the winter. Summer drought caused by the subtropical high. Potet is this red line, which again is just a function of temperature. So higher temperature in the summer, higher potet. The green line is actet. And there's different colors. So let's start off with... Let's start off with a spring. So here we have soil moisture utilization. You can see that the red line, potet, is higher than the blue line for precip. So there's more energy to use up water than we have water falling from the sky. And so we've got this light green color for soil moisture utilization. So that's just like the days. If you watered your plant Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, your plant would be doing soil moisture utilization. Uh, you can see there's a crossover in, in November where the precip exceeds the potet. And once the precip exceeds the potet, the first phase is going to be soil moisture recharge. This would be watering your plant just a little bit, the soil soaking up water. Sometime in January, though, the water, or, or rather the soil, is filled with water, and now there's uh, surplus. So there's going to be runoff. So if there's streams, you'd expect them to run. If there's streams that are being fed by surface water in Berkeley, you'd expect them to run from the end of January up through the end of March. And you can see at the end of March that that changes. Beginning of April, precip is now lower than potet. So the plants are using water from the soil. In the summer, they begin to run out of water in the soil. This peach color is a deficit. So you can see how you could, you could calculate all of this month by month. So here's the potet, here's the precip. If we knew what the soil water, if we knew how much water was in the soil, we could actually can calculate out what the soil water budget was for January and February and March and April. And in fact, in lab, that's exactly what we're going to do. In lecture, we're not going to get into the soil moisture utilization as much. 
Uh, we'll just do the numbers for a year overall. So for Berkeley, they get about 18 inches of rainfall. On the other hand, the the environment is such that over the course of a year, if plants were to use all the water that they could possibly use, they would need 36 inches. So if you've got 18 inches of rain, but you need 36, you're short 18. So the deficit is 18 inches. The actual amount of evaporation and transpiration is going to be 18 inches because that's all we had. If you have a deficit, you can't have a surplus. If you don't have enough water, you can't have too much. It just doesn't work that way. And for this, we're just going to ignore the changes to the soil moisture storage. That works out really well if you're looking at it month by month, but I just want to hit it in a broad, general sense, looking at it over the course of a year. So this was Berkeley. Berkeley ended up with a deficit of 18 inches. So if you lived in Berkeley and you had plants outside, you, you, over the course of a year, you'd need to add about 18 inches of water. So let's take a look at, at the soil water budget and a couple things that might help you calculate out the answers later on. So actet can never be more than potet. Potet represents energy to use water. So potet represents energy to use water. So if you have enough energy to evaporate 18 inches of water and you've got a lake that's four feet deep, it's not all going to evaporate. Only 18 inches are, are going to evaporate because that's all the energy you have to evaporate water. So even if you have more precip than you have potet, it doesn't matter because actet can't be more than potet. And again, potet represents energy to use water. If precip is less than potet, then precip will equal actet. Uh, at least in this scale, if we're looking, if we're going to add in soil moisture, then if precip is less than potet, precip plus soil moisture storage equals actet, because those are the two sources of supply for the water budget equation is precip and soil moisture. If precip is more than potet, potet equals actet, because actet can never, never, never be more than potet. So let's take a look at Seattle. They have a very different water budget than we do. So precip, they get about 50 inches of rain a year. Their potet is about 30 inches. So they don't have a deficit. The precip is greater than or equal to potet. So the actet is going to be 30 inches. We get 50 inches of rain. We have 30 inches of energy to use up that water. So the actet's going to be 30. That leaves us 20 inches. That's going to be surplus because in this example, we're not paying attention to the soil moisture storage. I think what I'm going to do is put up a uh, longer, not a longer video. I'm going to put up a separate other video on the soil water budget to give you some more examples and go over this in depth. For now, let's talk about surface and groundwater resources. Uh, so surface water is water in lakes, water in reservoirs. Groundwater is water that you usually get at with a well. So streams. Streams, there's a bunch of different types of streams. They have, they have names depending on how long they're flowing. There's perennial. Those flow all year. There's intermittent. Those flow occasionally. And a really nice way of thinking of the soil water budget is the landscape around you is a visible expression of the soil water budget. If there's a permanent deficit, then you can't have streams. You won't have lakes. If a region has lakes, then you know that they're running an annual water surplus. Uh, Texas, for example, has one natural lake. And that tells you a whole lot about the water budget for Texas. The highest stream flows in the world are found in the ITCZ, where they have the highest precipitation. So here we've got millimeters of rain. And again, the pattern is pretty clear. You've got the ITCZ, 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 ITCZ with the monsoonal rain for six months up there. And then at the higher latitudes, it's going to be uh, precip from the polar front, polar front, polar front, thunderstorms in the summertime, thunderstorms year round, thunderstorms year round, thunderstorms in the summertime, and then frontal precip year, uh, well, at least in the wintertime for the rest of uh, North America. Surface water, uh, humans tend to store it in reservoirs by using dams. The Three Gorges Dam in China is the largest dam in the world. 
California has 17 million acre feet of storage in 1,300 reservoirs across the state. California has 17 million acre feet of storage in 1,300 reservoirs. When we're talking about large amounts of water, it's often stored or uh, it's often measured in acre feet. An acre foot is really convenient for farmers. An acre foot is the amount of water it takes to cover an acre of land in water that is one foot deep. It's also convenient because the average family uses between half and one acre foot a year. So if I told you California has 17 million acre feet of storage, that's enough water for 17 to 34 million families for a year. Most of the water in California is used for agriculture, not domestic use. But if we stop doing anything but using water for household use, California theoretically has enough storage for the entire state for a year. Uh, this is just a shot of some construction photographs of the Three Gorges Dam. It is enormous. It costs an enormous amount of money. The dam itself is enormous. Hundreds of thousands of people were permanently displaced by the construction of the dam. On the other hand, China said, yeah, it was expensive and a whole lot of people had to move, but this river floods all the time, and when it floods, it costs us more money than it's going to cost us to build the dam. And when it flooded in the past, it displaced more people than have been displaced by the construction of the dam. So China looks at it as a win-win. The, the, the rest of the world sometimes looks at it and says, that doesn't seem like a good idea. You've got a really big dam upstream from some major population centers. Groundwater, again, is just water in the ground. It's a very, very important resource. About half of the country depends on groundwater. Groundwater is tied to surface water because that's where it comes from. Rain falls on the ground, the water percolates through the ground, and eventually it makes it into groundwater. The places where that happens are called recharge locations. Groundwater recharge happens at locations where water is entering the soil. If it's polluted, groundwater can be impossible to clean. In Santa Monica, most of the city depended on well water. The municipal water supply for Santa Monica was from wells. Most of those wells were contaminated by leaking gas station gas tanks, with the result that they no longer can use that groundwater. It is permanently contaminated with a chemical that causes cancer. So once groundwater is contaminated, it can be impossible to clean. This is showing some of the large aquifers. Groundwater is stored in an aquifer. It's porous rock, and the water actually exists in the little pores in the rock. For example, concrete. If you, if you spill water on concrete, the concrete will soak in a little bit of the water. The water is actually in the pore spaces in the concrete, and that's where water in aquifers is stored. It's not like giant underground caverns. Although that would be really cool if the water was stored in giant underwater caverns, it's just stored in poor spaces in the rock. So some of the important aquifers, the Central Valley Aquifer, incredibly important for agriculture in California, and the High Plains Aquifer. I've included a couple of videos on the High Plains Aquifer. We'll talk about it in just a minute, but it's also an incredibly important aquifer for the United States. And then globally, uh, we've got the Central Valley Aquifer, the High Plains Aquifer, the Gulf Coast Aquifer, some aquifers across Eurasia, across Northern Central Africa, across Australia. So groundwater globally is an incredibly important resource. I included this old National Geographic map showing aquifers across the United States, and I really like that they included the 100th Meridian, that magic line East of the 100th meridian, you get enough rain year-round. You don't need to irrigate. West of the 100th meridian, you're going to have to irrigate if you want to have crops. So it shows where the water is going in the west, what we're using it for, what it's used for on the east coast. There's some real big east-west differences. So aquifer is a layer of rock that is permeable to water, concrete, brick, sandstone. I mean, concrete and brick are, are man-made or human-made, but concrete, brick, sandstone is a rock. That's an example of a, a rock that would be porous. 
They can store vast quantities of water. They can be confined with an impermeable layer above, and then the layer that's the aquifer, and then an imper impermeable layer below. Or they can be unconfined. Let's take a, take a look. Surface water enters through the zone of aeration. Soil and rock aren't saturated. The pore space contains air. When the water reaches the zone of saturation, there the pores are completely filled with water. And the line in between the zone of saturation and the zone of aeration would, of course, be the water table. So if you're digging down through the ground, like at the beach, if you're a little kid and you're in the sand and you're digging down and you find uh, water, that would be the water table. So above that would be unsaturated, below that level, the, everything would be saturated with water. So here we have an unconfined aquifer. There's a layer of impermeable rock that the water can't go through. There's an unconfined aquifer saturated with, with water. This would be the zone of aeration. This would be the zone of saturation. And then right in between would be the water table, which is how far down you'd have to dig to find water. This is an unconfined aquifer. It's, it's got a layer underneath that the water can't go through. But there's nothing on top. If there's a layer, if there's the aquifer and it's like a sandwich cookie with a layer underneath and a layer on top that the water can't travel through, that's called a confined aquifer. And then some of the sources of pollution of groundwater, septic systems, industrial pollution, uh, feedlots for animals, landfills, all of those, gas, gasoline tanks at gas station, all of those are sources of pollution for aquifers. And remember, once an aquifer is contaminated, that's pretty much it. You can't use that water, for example, for drinking anymore. It's just too hard to clean up. So springs happen when the water table is higher than the surface. Groundwater can enter stream channels to flow as surface water. So streams are places where the water can be re-entering groundwater. It could be a recharge area. Artesian wells are the same as springs. That's where the water table is higher than the surface and water. With an artesian well, the water is coming out under its own pressure. You don't have to actually pump it. So here you can see uh, this would be a confined aquifer and you've got a spring. If conditions were slightly different, you had a permeable layer of the aquifer, you could also get an artesian well with the water coming up under its own power. Here we've got a, a spring Fred Creek in Nebraska flowing out of the High Plains aquifer. So the High Plains aquifer, let's talk about the High Plains aquifer and groundwater mining. So groundwater mining refers to when water is pumped out faster than it's being replaced. And groundwater is replaced from streams and from precipitation. Some of the problems with groundwater mining are that it leads to aquifer collapse, subsidence, and saltwater intrusion. The High Plains Aquifer is an incredibly important aquifer in the United States. In some places, the, the water table has actually dropped 150 feet because they've pumped out so much water. It is North America's largest underground reservoir. Here we can see the High Plains Aquifer runs all the way from the middle of Texas up through Nebraska. This chart is showing, or this, this map is showing, <clears throat> the thickness of the layer of saturated aquifer. So 400 to 1,200 feet thick, 0 to 99 feet thick. And then this is showing the water level change. So right here, probably on the plat, you can see that it's come up a bit, but most of the rest of it, in fact, in some places, we've lost up to 150 feet. So if you had a well and it's not pumping water anymore and you wanted to get water, you'd have to hire somebody to dig down another 120 feet lower into the earth in order to still be able to pump water. This is the way Earth looked at the time when the High Plains Aquifer was being recharged. So it was the melting of these ice sheets. This is about 20,000 years ago. You can see most of North America, or at least most of uh, northern U.S. and Canada, was covered with ice. About 30% of Earth was covered with ice this time. In fact, you could walk all the way from like Chicago up to there was no... Uh, Everything's under ice, everything's under ice, all the way out to Greenland and to Iceland, walking on ice sheets. And then here, other ice sheets. These ice sheets would have been on the land. When they melted, that water became the High Plains Aquifer. So it's not like it's being fully replaced right now, just from natural rainwater. This is old water. 
as they pump out the water, the land surface actually subsides, it sinks. This is a center pivot irrigation. So there's a long, long, long sprinkler. This sprinkler could be half a mile long and it just goes around and around and they're pumping out groundwater. They're probably growing alfalfa. They grow a lot of grain in the, the Plains states. So they're using, they're pumping out groundwater to grow things like alfalfa, soybeans, wheat. There's a shot of one of those long sprinkler arms. I included this to show why you get subsidence. Once, once you pump out the water, if there's water in the ground, the weight of the surface of the ground is pressing down, but it can't collapse anything because the water doesn't compress. If you remove the water, then you get pore spaces, you get air, and there's nothing left to resist the weight of gravity, and so the ground sinks. And so subsidence is one of the consequences of groundwater mining. Here's another one, it's called saltwater intrusion. So if we sunk a well and started pulling out this groundwater, there would be less groundwater here, and eventually you'd start pulling in salty ocean water. So now you're pumping up salt water. This well is useless. You can't use it anymore. It's been contaminated with salt water. This is happening in the Delta region in Sacramento as a result of overuse of groundwater. So another on the bottom, another example of subsidence. So we have sediment. The sediment grains are held apart by the water. As we pump out the water, the grains get more compact, the ground gets more compact, the ground sinks. And once the ground sinks, once you get that compression, that groundwater resource is lost forever. There's, there's no more space. It's, it's like a sponge. If you were standing on a sponge, if you filled a sponge with water and you stood on it, you'd squeeze out the water. But then if you poured water on the ground, the sponge doesn't have the ability to reinflate and lift you up. Another example showing what's happening in the Central Valley as we pull out water, there is settling, subsidence, aquifer collapse, and then again, that resource is lost forever. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is the level of the ground. If you, we were here in 1925, this ground would have been this high. They've pumped out so much water in the San Joaquin Valley from 1925 to 19, 1977 that the land has actually sunk that much. Other threats to the High Plains Aquifer, the Keystone XL pipeline was going to run through it. They're already having spills in the Keystone XL pipeline. Native American people said, don't do this. This is a very, very bad idea. But we did it anyway, and now it's leaking. There you go. High Plain, the Keystone XL, let's just run it right across the High Plains Aquifer and hope that nothing happens. I've also included a video on Nebraska's sand hills. It's a really, really interesting area up here in Nebraska. Hope you watch that. I've also included a video on hydraulic fracturing or fracking. This is a trailer for a movie called Gasland that was put out in 2010 by a guy named Josh Fox. Well worth watching. I hope you watch it. Our water supply. Worldwide, water use is increasing at twice the rate of population growth. So we already know that groundwater is a limited resource. Only so much round groundwater gets replaced by rainwater. And if we're pumping out faster than it's being replaced by rainwater, we're going to damage that resource and we'll lose it as a resource. At the same time that there's less clean water because we're continuing to pollute it and we're con we are continuing to overuse it, population growth is also happening. So there's more people, there's less water, and both of these trends are continuing. Groundwater mining is draining aquifers. Water use isn't evenly distributed. Not all countries use the same amount of water. In the United States, we use a lot of water. Other countries, less developing countries, have countries that don't have running water or countries that have areas of where people don't have running water would use far less water. Globally, there's a decline in water in the storage of groundwater. You can see all of these lines are decreasing. The Middle East is slightly reversing that trend, but they've still probably lost a lot of groundwater. Uh, India, especially hard hit. The Central Valley of the United States, we're losing groundwater. So all over the world, people are overusing groundwater. In the United States, water isn't 
isn't distributed evenly by space and water isn't distributed evenly by seasons, especially in California. In California, it's really out of whack. We get most of our rain in the wintertime and when we need all that water is in the summertime. And the way that we get through that is by snow. So in California, it's also out of whack in terms of space. Two thirds of the people live south of where most of the rain falls. Northern California gets most of the rain has few people. Southern California gets very little rain, but has a whole lot of people. So we have an elaborate system of aqueducts and canals and reservoirs to transfer water from Northern California to Southern California. This is a breakdown of what happens to rain that falls across the entire United States, averaged out over an entire year. So 4,200 billion gallons. We've got evaporation, farms, evaporation, forest evaporation, other vegetation, evaporation, uh, water that's used and consumed, water that's used and then replaced back into the stream, run off into the ocean. So about 71% of the water that falls, or 71% of the rain that falls in the U.S. is going to go back out into the atmosphere. And about 29% is going to get used, either withdrawn or in-stream use. If it's withdrawn, it gets used up. It goes back into the atmosphere. If it's in-stream use, uh, some of it gets used, but some of it goes back into the stream. This is California. What happens with water in California? We get about 200 million acre feet a year. Evapotranspiration uses up 115 million acre feet. 20 million acre feet go to stream flow. Of the remaining water, 60, 65 million acre feet, 54% is used for ag, 14% is used for domestic use, landscaping, households, industrial uses, and 32% goes to other stream flows in the Central Valley. Let's talk about pollution. In pollution, there's two types, or surface water pollution is divided up into point source. And the way I think of it is like, if you can point at it, like, oh, it's that factory there, that's point source. So it's stationary, small scale, as opposed to, well, single pipe, single factory. Yeah, it's that ship. That's where the pollution's coming from. So that's a point source. Non-point source would be an area, like an entire suburban area. Uh, Cars drip oil onto the ground, onto the roads, and then when it rains, that water washes off into the storm systems over a large area. So it's not a point. It's not that one factory. It's like that whole city. The runoff from the whole city is contaminated. That would be non-point source. Runoff contains fertilizers, pesticides, animal waste, oil, road salt deposits. All of that gets carried back into water. And then if it's recharging groundwater, it could potentially be polluting that groundwater resource forever. So we could look at point sources, that factory, non-point sources, those fields, non-point sources, that suburb, point source, that wastewater treatment plant. Water scarcity is kind of alarming. Uh, Population is continuing to increase on Earth, and one of the former heads of the CIA has testified before Congress that the next wars won't be fought over oil, but water. And I think he's got an excellent point. We've got sources of energy aside from oil, but there's no source of water aside from water. So let's look at water scarcity on the Colorado River. The Colorado River is an exotic stream. It starts in a humid region in Colorado, in the highlands of Colorado. There's a moisture surplus, but then it flows through a desert where there's a water deficit. So an exotic stream is a stream or a river that starts in a region with a water surplus, but then flows, eventually ends up in an area with a water deficit. The Colorado provides water to Las Vegas, Phoenix, Tucson, Denver, San Diego, and Albuquerque and there's a growing water problem. This is a map showing the drainage basin of the Colorado River. So all the water that falls in this green area is going to run into a stream that's going to run into something that's eventually going to take it into the Colorado River. So here we can see the headwaters near Mount Richthofen. And the Colorado River doesn't empty into the Gulf of California anymore. It evaporates. And over here, you can see the stream flow at Yuma, decreasing, 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 decreasing. 
There's a blow up. Decreasing, 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 which is really unfortunate because it was one of these years that they picked when California and Nevada and Utah and Colorado and Arizona decided to divide up the uh, water flowing down the Colorado. Colorado. Went like this. Well, this year we got 25 million acre feet. So how about everybody just takes 5 million acre feet? Everybody thought about it and said, yeah, that sounds good. A couple problems with this though. They took what turns out to be one of the wettest years ever recorded on the Colorado River. You can see in some years, it's barely even registering. So they didn't take a proportion of the current flow. They took a portion of what was the highest flow ever. And that's, that's really the biggest problem. Uh, let's take a look. Here's another one showing thousands of acre feet. So this would be 5 million acre feet. Here we've got 25 million acre feet back in looks like uh, 1909. So yeah, they, they saw a flow of 25 million acre feet once. And you can see here later years, there's just not enough water even really to show up. So we've got five states with growing populations. So the, the demand is increasing for two reasons. One, there's increasing population. And two, there's climate change, which is warming everything, which means that there's more evapotranspiration. At the same time, the precipitation regime has changed that a lot of the, the water that flows through the Colorado starts off as snow. But as the climate warms, that snow melts off earlier and evaporates rather than sticking around and then melting and running into the Colorado. So the supply is decreasing and the demand is increasing. Climate change, increasing temperatures, increasing evaporation rates, decreased snowpack, all of those causing problems solutions. The only solution is really going to be conservation. And I've included a couple videos on problems with water on the Colorado River. Las Vegas especially is going to be having huge problems. Arizona is going to be having problems as the flow on the Colorado continues to decline. California also will be having huge problems because we depend on Colorado River water. We depend on Colorado River water for a lot of agriculture in Southern California. And here is Lake Mead, uh, 1983. We almost lost it because of flooding, but you can see 2015, the lake had declined and declined and declined. Water scarcity in California, largely a function of Sierra snowpack. I mentioned that snow is how we shift in time the water supply in California. So we don't get rain in the summer. We don't get rain really in late spring. Not, not substantial amounts of rain, but we have snowpack that melts in the spring and in the summer. So it acts like rain. But as the climate continues to change, we get less and less snow. And the snow that we do get tends to melt out earlier and earlier, which led to the ongoing drought in California. We've had a, at least one wet year, but I think this year snowpack is about 52% of normal. So we're right back into a drought. Although at some point we're going to have to stop thinking of it as a drought. Nobody looks at the Sahara and says, well, it's a drought. It's just a desert. Drought would be unusual. And uh, dry conditions in the Southwest United States, it's not unusual. It's normal. So again, snowpack, you people live in California, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Forests are feeling the problem as the water evaporates, as the snow melts and then the water evaporates, drought is killing trees. This guy in the red jacket is a guy named Frank Gerke, and he was the head of the snow survey. They use these aluminum tubes. They know how much the tube weighs. And the way you use it is you stick it down through the snowpack at these certain locations. They have trails that they walk, and there's different points on the trail where they stop and uh, jam these tubes into the snow, and then they weigh it. And by weighing it, you know what the water content of the snow is. So water managers that are trying to figure out how much water they're going to have for the next year, they don't care how, how many feet of snow they get. They want to know what the water content of the snow is. And the way they do that is using that aluminum tube. On this day, this was the lowest year on record, 2015. This was the last station on the snow survey. There's supposed to be feet of snow. President uh, Governor Brown held a press conference to demonstrate the lack of snow by having Frank come out and do what he's supposed to do with the aluminum tubes, except there was no snow. 
The lack of snow has caused a huge die-off of trees across the Sierra, millions and millions and millions of trees. Uh, these are these are regions of the world that have water scarcity. We we have you can see for the most part little to no water scarcity. The areas in red have physical water scarcity. That would just be a lack of supply. Some places have economic scarcity where there's water, but people lack the money to to uh, buy a pump to run a well to irrigate their crops. And then there's other regions that are approaching water scarcity. This region, especially uh, in between China and India, especially, especially vulnerable for water scarcity issues. A lot of the water that they use comes off of glaciers in the Himalayas. Those glaciers are shrinking every year with climate change. So the overall supply every year is getting lower and lower and lower. India and China, the two largest countries in the world, over a third of all of the people in the world depend or live in this region. Not all of them clearly depend on that water, but politically, it's an unstable region. Politically, India and China have had problems in the past, and that's just going to get worse when they start to argue over water, because as I said before, there's no substitute for water. The brown areas have a high likelihood of political problems due to lack of water or water resources. So we've got the Himalayas again. We're back to the Himalayas with India and China, Sudan in, in Africa. Much of the plain states in the United States could have issues with water going forward. I mentioned water use is doubling, is, or rather water use is increasing twice as fast as the population is growing. So we've got changes in population. We've got changes in water use. Solutions, desalination is very expensive. You can build a plant and actually pump out the salt from seawater and you end up with fresh water, but that water is very expensive. So the only places that they do that are places that have more money than they have water. So some of the Gulf states that have a lot of oil money, they're doing desalination. San Diego has a desal plant. Santa Barbara has one that they've used from time to time. So desalination right now is incredibly energy and money intensive. And so it's not not as common as you'd think it would be, given that we've got an unlimited supply of water in the ocean. It just takes too much energy, too much money to make it worthwhile. Conservation is much easier. Changes in irrigation, changes in uh, bathroom fixtures, like showers, like toilets, like sinks, all those things, much easier to do than finding new sources of water. Drip irrigation, where instead of flooding a whole field, you're actually just applying water to the plants directly. Here's an example of drip irrigation. You can tell it's drip irrigation because look, there's a drop. And that's it for chapter five. That went super fast. Up next is going to be chapter six. I hope you have a good day.